Action Church, we doing well? Everybody good? Come on. You are at church in a pandemic on Father's Day. Like, you love the Lord. I don't know if you know this, but Mother's Day is one of the top three most attended uh, Sundays in Action Church and, and really the church in America, top three. Father's Day is bottom three. Come on, guys. We're just not coming to church. Like, if you're here, you just love the Lord or your wife made you come. I'm not sure which one it is, but you're here. If you're watching online, we're judging you in our hearts. I'm just kidding. There's so many good reasons for you to be watching online or at a pop-up right now. Happy Father's Day uh, to all the dads. I brought, uh, I brought four dad jokes today. You want to hear them? Four dad jokes. We got a, we got a pretty, pretty heavy message today. We're in a three-week series, if you're new with us, called Rain, uh, talking about the kingdom and the authority of God. And, and in a democratic society, it's really, you really stuck up on a lot of toes when you start talking about words like surrender and humility and, and lay down some things to God. And so we're going to get there in just a moment. But I thought we have some dad jokes first. I need to let you know that, that Pastor Tyler Altoff sent those, these to me. So if you like them, I tweaked them and delivered them just perfectly. If you don't like them, please send an email to tyler.altoff at theactionchurch.com. Here's four dad jokes. What do you call it when Batman skips church? Christian Bale. <laughs> what I love about dad jokes is they just, they work throughout the room. You know what I mean? They just, they just show up a little later than most things. Kind of like a good case of heartburn. Just hits you a little bit later. Why does, why does Snoop Dogg always carry an umbrella? Snoop Dogg always carry an umbrella for drizzle. If you don't get it, then you don't listen to enough Snoop Dogg. And so... Why do, why do some couples go to the gym? Because they want their relationship to work out. That was safe. 9 a.m. like these way better. I don't know if you just, you don't have, you don't, honestly, you don't have a good dad or granddad in your life. We have small groups, so we have great men's groups. Maybe you just need a, a cheesy dad or granddad in your life. Here's the last one. I wanted to go on a diet, but I feel like I have way too much on my plate right now. <laughs> it's, it's true. Week three of rain. We're going to move on. I got all the credit in the first service because those jokes crushed. Second service is all Pastor Tyler's fault. Psalm 97. Here's the, here's the theme. Is that we live, we live in a, a democratic society in our country, but, but, but God operates in a kingdom. And in a, in a kingdom, authority is key. And God is all powerful and we are not. So if we want to win, if we want to succeed, if we want to obey in a kingdom, that the key word that you need to get is the word surrender. That it's not fight, it's not control, it's not try harder. To succeed in the kingdom of God, it's releasing, it's, it's surrender. And the theme for our, our series has been our vulnerability. Our vulnerability gives Jesus the ability to fight and overcome everything that we struggle against. That we do not fight on our own if we've taken uh, 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 Jesus as our Lord and Savior, received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We don't fight on our own, that we have the ability to fight and overcome based off what Jesus did on the cross. Psalm 97 says this, but our theme passage, I want to read verses 1 and then 9 through 12. It says, the Lord is king, let the earth rejoice. For you, O Lord, are supreme over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. And we talked about that last week, that the idols must fall down our life, that, that God has to reign supreme, that, that he's over everything, that all other gods will fall down. He will be exalted. You who love the Lord, you hate evil. He protects the lives of his godly people and rescues them from the power of the wicked. Verse 11, light shines on the godly. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the, the light of the gospel shining in some of the, the darkest areas of our lives. This light shines on the godly and joy on those whose hearts are right. May all who are godly rejoice in the Lord and praise his holy name. We're going to talk today about, about some blind spots in our life. And this third part of this, this song that we've been kind of taking this series from that darkness is, is, is going to flee. Darkness will, will run. We've got to bring light into those situations. And to do that, we've got to take some, some blinders off if we want to live in the kingdom of God, if we want to live in God's best for our life, if we want to fulfill God's will for our life. We need darkness to be removed, and we need to walk 
We need to walk in the light. We're gonna use a, a, a verse, um, a passage in the New Testament today, John chapter nine. And in John chapter nine, I need to paraphrase this story for you real quick, and then I wanna read you the end, and then we're gonna go through the whole thing. John chapter nine, we referenced it in week one of this series, is where Jesus heals the blind beggar. Remember, it's where he spits on the dirt, he makes mud, he rubs it on his eyes, and can we all just be clear at Action Church that that's nasty whether you're the Messiah or not. Like, that's just gross. Like, like Jesus' spit was just as gross as ours. Like, that's nasty. He rubs it. The guy walks uh, to the pool, uh, cleanses himself, rubs the water on his eyes, comes out seeing. And what, what, I, what I missed in this story for, for so long is the next 30 or so verses, the next, the next uh, yeah, 32, 33 verses, where this, there's this dialogue that happens, there's this argument that happens with the people in the village, the people in the community, and the Pharisees, where they begin to, to ask all these questions of this man and of his family. How did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did it happen on the Sabbath? Who is this Jesus? They begin to, to criticize all of this stuff, and then Jesus addresses them at the end of the story. Now that we have some context to what's happening in John chapter nine, he says this at the end of John nine, and then we'll flip back and study it together this morning. It says, then Jesus told them, this is the Pharisees who had been questioning him. It says, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees who are standing nearby heard him and asked, are you saying that we are blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied, but you remain guilty because you claim you can see. I want to talk today about the areas of our life that we need to remove the blinders. Some of those are, we we're claiming that we can see some things that, that God is saying, no, we're seeing them wrong with. There's some things that are blinding us from what's actually happening. We just, we don't notice some things. I think today's a, a day of clarity, bringing, bringing to light some things that we didn't notice. Anybody else like me that, that maybe sometimes you wait a little too long to, to change the, the light bulbs in certain areas of your house? Anybody, everybody ever, ever walked into somebody's house and thought, man, it's really dark in here. Like, how do you live like this? Like, like me in my bathroom, sometimes you got... 12, 14 lights in there. You know, you got all the lights on the top and you, you let the last one burn out and you're like, oh, we should change these now. And somebody else walks in, you're like, you wonder why you're wearing the wrong color shoe, a different, a different outfit, you didn't shave half your face. It's because you couldn't see because you've been living, you've been living in the dark. It's the same with our cars. You ever got in somebody's car and you're like, what's that smell? And they're like, what? It smells like my car. No, it smells like somebody died in here. Because we're just blind to some things. We grow accustomed to some things. I think there's some blind spots in our life. There's some, some darkness in our life that's keeping us from God's best. It's keeping us from operating in God's kingdom. It's keeping from God reigning in our life. Let's study this uh, book of the Bible. We're gonna study the whole book today, all of John chapter nine. Some of you are like, wow, that's gonna take a long time. No, I promise we're gonna be out of here in 35 minutes. And some of you are gonna read a whole chapter of the Bible for the first time in your life. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. John chapter nine, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who'd been blind from birth. Rabbi, the disciple, asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. Let's stop right there just for a moment. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. I need you to know that we live in a fallen world and that sin has entered the world and there are things that happen that, that God is not uh, causing to happen, but that he can use bad things and redeem those and bring out some really, really great outcomes. And so what we're seeing here is that, that God is reigning. And so Jesus said, you're asking the wrong question. Who sinned? What happened? No, Jesus is saying God allowed this to happen and is using this for his greater glory. And if we don't get that as believers, you gotta catch this church, if we don't get that, we will never operate in the full power in the kingdom of God. That he is in control and that we are not. That his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We think this man was born blind. That's not fair. Our God never promised to be fair. He promised to be just. And he promised to use everything that's going on for his glory. Again, he's God and we are not. And if you try and put your opinion or your will or your sense of faith 
fairness on the almighty God, you will always, we will always find ourselves disappointed. So Jesus said, you're, you're asking the wrong question, that he, he was created and, and he was made for this very moment, that God has used this defect, he's used this disability, he's used this disability for an opportunity for God to get the glory. It says that, says that we must use uh, this quick uh, to carry out the tasks quickly that are assigned to us before the night is coming where no one can work. That's what we always got to be about kingdom business, about God's business, that we don't know when the night is coming and there will be no more time for us to work. And so that's why it's important for us to live on purpose and be people of action. Verse five, but while I'm in, here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then verse six, then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. Again, that's nasty. You don't care who you are. He told them, go wash yourself in the pool. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? They knew him as the blind beggar beggar. The first thing that, that will blind us, church, is our condition. We're blinded by our own condition. That's how they knew this man. Uh, we, we read over scripture and we miss some details like they, they, he's not named here because society and the village and the people around, they just knew him as that's the guy that shows up here probably a little bit dirtier than everybody else, probably a little worse dressed than everybody else. He's blind and that is the blind beggar. That's who he is. His condition in life had defined his whole existence. And what is keeping God from reigning in your life and you fulfilling the plan that he has for you is that you're blinded by your own condition. Maybe it's a heaviness of heart, it's a, it's a grief, it's a, it's a season of loss. Maybe it's, it's depression or anxiety. Maybe it's something that somebody did to you when you were a child. Maybe it's, it's shame and guilt for what you've done to somebody else and you've, you've allowed the enemy and you've allowed the world and you've allowed people to identify you by your condition. And that the condition defines you and blinds you to the opportunities that God has for your life. I don't know if you're like me, but my condition and the things that I go through and then what that produces in, in my thought life can be very, very dangerous. Can anybody else agree with that? That, 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 we, tell, that we tell the best lies to ourselves. Like anybody else connect some dots in your brain that just don't connect? Come on, you read something on social media, you hear something on the news, somebody says something about you, something happens to you, somebody doesn't speak to you in the foyer at church or in your business, somebody treats you like you assume that they slighted you at a small group or at a gathering, and you and I, we will go connect every dot until they're the worst human ever, they hate us, and we're thinking about murdering them later. Like, come on, somebody, nobody's ever, I'm the only crazy one in here, okay? As you holy people start a small group and pray for us unholy people that just sometimes connect some lies in our own brain that just don't make any sense. We're, we're, we're identifying and we're blinded by our own condition. Here's the practical way to get rid of that. Just say what you're thinking out loud. The Bible says that we're, 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 we're healed when we confess one to another, but maybe just start confessing it to yourself. Maybe you're not ready to tell somebody else, I think you need to get there, it's biblical, but maybe just say what you're thinking out loud and say, I sound like an idiot. I'm ready to kill them and all they did was ignore me in the hallway. But the enemy's using that to connect dots from your childhood and from past hurt and all of these things and now you get this condition where I, I am rejected. That's, that's who I am. I'm just here to tell you there's there's a savior, there's a healer, there's somebody that wants to not know you or identify you by, you, identify you by your condition, but, but use your condition and bring healing to it so that, that he can get the glory. You know, the healing in this story comes from Jesus. Make no mistake about it. Healing only comes from the supernatural power of God. But the man had a part to play. Did you catch that? Like, he, he, he spit 
disgusting. He rubbed it on his eyes, and then he didn't just walk away and the guy could see. He said, I need you to take a step of obedience. I need you to go down to the pool. I need you to wash your eyes. I need you to wash your face, and then when you open them, you will be able to see. He had a part to play to walk out in faith and obedience to see the miracle. And I'm just here to tell you today that that is what God is asking us to do, that God can heal you in an instant, but there will be a path of faith and a path of obedience that you and I are called to walk out. So bad. So good. And somebody here at Winter Park or Sanford or South Carolina needs to hear that you are so much more than what you're currently struggling with. So strong. Come on. You're so much more than what you're currently struggling with. You are so much more than what the village or your family or your friends have identified you as. That's the blind beggar. That's the abused little boy or little girl. That's the addict. That's the depressed. You know, they they struggle with mental illness. If somebody has tagged you with a title every time they introduce you, I'm here today to tell you that God can break you free from that condition. And can you imagine, can you imagine this blind beggar? He is an adult man. We'll find that out later. His parents say he's old enough to speak for himself. He is an adult. Can you imagine the moment that he wiped his eyes and saw for the first time? Like, can you imagine how blue the sky was? Can you imagine the the tree that he probably sat under and felt the bark and and, and felt the leaves the first time he saw that tree and the root system and the intricacies of all of God's creation? Can you imagine the first time that he saw his parents' face, the one that he had felt and the voices that he had heard? Can you imagine the awe and the faith and the surprise and the, the newness of everything? I think spiritually speaking today, God is trying to do the same thing all throughout our church where your eyes are open, that you are not your condition, that God wants you to see, not through the eyes of fear, but through the eyes of faith, not through the eyes of worry, but through the eyes of peace. Like there is something that God wants to remove from your eyes today, and it is your condition that he died, that he paid a price for you to overcome that condition. Can you imagine how grateful that guy must have been? Where he said, I I went years without seeing and now I can see. That's why my favorite people to hang around are people that were really lost and then got really saved. Because they're like, you you don't understand who I was. And now look at what God has done in my life. This, This guy would have never regretted one day of being blind the moment that he could see. And he would never take for granted what you and I would always take for granted. That's right. That's right. There's a perspective that he had that God was, was using to build his faith and build the faith in others. We're blinded by our condition. Here's the second one. Let's go down to verse nine. Verse nine of chapter nine. The second one is we're blinded by our opinion. We're blinded by our opinion. Verse nine, some said he was Uh, some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. So they're talking about this guy who used to be blind. They're like, oh, the blind beggar? Oh, the one we see every day? Now Jesus does a miracle. Now the miracle's right in front of them, and they're like, oh, I don't don't know if that's him. Uh, Actually, it could be the same guy. Looks kind of like him. I don't, yeah, a lot of guys probably have dirt and mud streaming down their face, and now they were blind, and now they can see. It's probably somebody else. We'll always try and quantify what God does and make, make sense of it in our own brains and discount what God is doing. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the one. Like, he's like, look at me, smell me. I have spit on my face. (laughs) I am the one, they asked. Who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now, they asked. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man uh, who had been blind to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made this mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it, So he told them, he put the mud over my eyes. Again, he's repeating himself over and over again. Again, he put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man, Jesus, is not from God because he's working on the Sabbath. God, religious people miss the main thing so many times. Others said, but how can an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? Here's the point. So there was a deep division of opinion among them. 
Second thing that blinds us, church, the darkness that's in our life that keeps us from, from reigning with God in his kingdom and, and allowing him to lead our life is that we're blinded by our own opinion. And we talk about this a lot because I just, I see it so much in our society. I see it so much in my own life. We, we idolize our own opinion. Well, that's, Pastor, that's just, that's just not how I see it. Okay. That's just not what I think about it. And, and I get it politically. We're, we're, we're divided as a nation, we're, and that, that's, that's just where we are. I, I, I get it when it com- comes to social issues. I, I, I get it. I, I don't understand sometimes how you got there, but, but, but I get it. But I don't understand how the church is divided on, on what, what truth is. Like we've, we've idolized our opinion over the word of God. Like I see it all the time. We'll be talking about something in, in, in church or in a small group or in action steps, and they'll say, "Well, Pastor, I just don't, I just don't, I just don't see it that way." Okay, well, let's 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 not take my opinion over your opinion or or your opinion over my opinion. Let's take it to the Word of God, and we'll sit with people and we'll point it out. And if you can get a close up of this, there's there's red letters in here, and the red letters, if you're new to church, is what Jesus said. So it's not just like this, this any, all the Bible is Holy Spirit inspired, it is infallible, we believe it from Genesis to maps. But like, I really just take extra, extra care of what the Son of God said. Like if he was good enough to live, uh, live for me, die for me, erase a life, like I'm gonna listen to what he said. And we'll read it and they'll say, yeah, I just, I, I don't think I can go there with him. I, I, don't, I don't believe that. Well, this is, this is not a buffet. This is not like a pick and choose what you want. Like this is, this is not like, hey, I'll have some of this and I won't have some of this. This is like, this is like eat your vegetables, son. You know what I mean? Like this is like, this is, this is take the part that you like and take the part that you don't like. It just, our opinions are keeping us from inheriting the kingdom of God. It says surrender all of you and accept all of me. Here, here's one that's gonna, this one's gonna get everybody. I'm sorry, this is, this is gonna get me. I've been there before. I've led and asked this before, but not anymore. Bible studies at Action Church. Small groups are happening. We're having Bible studies all across our, our communities. Love uh, when people dive into God's word. But here's a question that I have a small group leader have asked, and I know that you've asked it. And, and it's, just, it's just the wrong question to ask. We'll read, this, we'll read this verse out of scripture. And then we'll go around the room and we'll say, hey, we just read verse 33. What, did, what does that mean to you? Oh, that's so sweet. Oh, man, praise God. Now, what does that mean to you? Oh, yes, yep, absolutely. Now, what? and we've just heard three different things that it meant to people. You know why? Because it doesn't matter what it means to you. It matters what it means. Like, like what, does, what did the author, inspired by the Holy Spirit, say in context? What does the scripture mean? Truth applied will change your life. Your opinion or variation of God's truth will do nothing. Seven claps in here, because everybody else is like, I, like, I like my opinion of God's word. Your opinion of God's word will never bring forth life in your life. It's God's word and the truth of God's word applied to your life. We're blinded by our opinions, and we're so quick to share them. I was reminded of this verse this week. Put it up on the screen. Let's read it together. Be very slow to listen quick to speak, and even quicker to become angry. It's like the American way. (laughs) No, it says you must all be what? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. What if we were a little slower to form our opinion and a little quicker to listen to people's predicament. And then go to God's word, listen to people, listen to God, listen to God, listen to people. And then from the wisdom of listening and praying and seeking God and now sharing his word, we began to speak. I don't know that we get to the third one very often. but I think we get it backwards. Can we put it back up? Put it back up real quick. I think we get angry and then we speak and therefore there's nobody left to listen to (laughs) except the people that think just like us. 
That's why that order is important. Because yeah. I have to listen and then speak and then I don't know that I'll be very angry anymore. Let's keep reading verse 17. Oh man, I can't wait for Songfest. Songfest is coming in August. We're gonna have a ton of fun. We're just gonna laugh and smile and listen to some songs. It'll be so great. You know, it says the word of God is like a double-edged sword. It cuts coming in and it cuts coming out. And, and I just, there's just times in our church where we need to take a season and say, God, remove the things that are not from you, from my life. And that's just, that's just what we're doing today and that's never a fun process, but, but it's needed. Amen. Here's verse 17, let's keep reading together. Then the Pharisees again question. Again, they're still questioning. The guys in front of them, they're still questioning. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blinded and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leader still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see. So they called his parents. Again, this adult man, they called his parents. They asked him, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, uh, we know this is our son <laughs> and that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He is old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said he is old enough, ask him. They were afraid of declaring that Jesus was the Messiah because they would get kicked out of the church. Just catch that. So far the second time, so for the second time they called in the man who had been blind and told him, um, God should get the glory for this because we know this man Jesus is a sinner. Verse 25, this is my favorite verse in the whole chapter. I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied, but I know this, I was blind and now I can see. Like that, that's, that's the start. I'm gonna take you on a journey. How, how do you win people to the Lord? How, how, do you, how do you witness to people? You just do exactly what this guy just did. I don't have all the details. This is for all the new people in church, the new people in your faith, the new people that are going to action steps and beginning to live on purpose. You don't have a lot of Bible knowledge yet. You don't have a lot of godly wisdom yet. You just have what God did for you. Just say this. I, I don't know all the things about Action Church. I don't know all the things and why there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. I don't know all of the doctrine that you're trying to trap me with. All I know is I was blind and now I can see. Like there's just, God did something in me. No opinion, just facts that I was blind and now I can see, that I was lost and now I'm found, that I was addicted and now that I'm free, that I was broken and now I'm made whole, that I was full of anxiety and now I have peace. But here's my challenge to Action Church. Let's not stop there. It's a lazy version of Christianity to get saved and just live off of that one experience for the rest of your life. Because your story will never change another life and will never change somebody's eternity. Wait a second, you just told me to share my story. Your story is a conduit to sharing God's story of salvation and grace, and you only get that from here. The facts of your journey are an introduction to the truth of God's story, and that is what changes people's life. It's not the gospel of Justin, what God did for me. It's the gospel of Jesus, of what he did for everybody, and I've got to know what it says in here to actually be effective. Too many of us stop at an experience and we have to have experiences in our relationships, in our marriages, with our kids. I'm not saying that God is not a God of experience and moments. I'm just saying if you don't combine your experience with God, with the truth of God, you will never play the part he's calling you to play in his kingdom. It's just, it's just not gonna happen. Verse 26, but what, what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? They're asking the wrong question. They, who is this man, Jesus? How did he get this power? Where does he come from? They're asking how. How did he heal you? They're, they're asking the wrong questions over and over again. Look, the man exclaimed, I told you once. Didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? I love this guy. Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple. They said this condescending. They're talking about Jesus. And they said, you, you are his disciple. But we, we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Let's stop. How did they know God spoke to Moses? 
Ever thought about that? Because tradition had told them that. They're in a moment with the Messiah and they're saying, no, I, hey, hey, Moses, Moses part of the rest. We know God spoke to Moses. No, you heard God spoke to Moses. So many times we, we take the word of tradition or what somebody said versus what we see in front of us. Now, they should have been followers of Moses. They should have, they should have absolutely known his teachings and respected his teachings, but they're missing Jesus over something that happened before. They're missing what God, what I'm trying to say is they're missing what God is doing now by celebrating what God did before. Because our religion, our tradition will blind us as well. I wrote this down this week. I'd love to share it with you. We're running out of time. Make sure you hear my heart on this. Too often we settle for a memory and miss the moment. If your memories keep you from moving forward, then you've turned what God did into something that now blocks what he wants to do. You've made a memory into a memoir, a relic, or even an idol. So I'm not saying that we don't read and we don't learn. We talked about the truth of God. I'm not saying that we don't celebrate. I'm not saying we don't use other people's stories and what God did to build our faith. But if it doesn't build our faith for what he's doing now and in the future, we've missed it. And that's what church has done. There will be a time, catch this, this will blow some of your minds. There will be a church, a time where Action Church looks completely different than it does right now. I don't know if small groups change, if steps change, if we lose the dinosaur in the room. Like, I don't know what. It's the jib camera for those of you. The same people that didn't get joke three didn't get that either. I got you, I got you. Somebody elbow him, wake him up, tell him later. This pastor's really funny, thank you. Because tradition and religion is not the, the game, it's not the method. This whole chapter is saying, hey, church, hey, religious leaders, hey, people who love tradition, you're asking the wrong questions. You're arguing the wrong thing. You're fighting the wrong fight. The miracle is right in front of you. And it's amazing how many times religion misses the relational and the all-powerful supernatural gospel because we're looking at the wrong thing. Our, our religion, our tradition, is, it's blinding us. It's blinding us. Here, let's finish it right here. They throw him out. We finish verse 34. It says, why? That's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he's ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. Man, this guy's preaching. Then the Pharisees, you were born a total sinner. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. The church, instead of elevating the supernatural power of God because they couldn't explain it and because it was done on the wrong time, on the wrong day, and without their, their approval, they said, get it out of here. And when we elevate our religiousness over the power of God, we miss out on the miracle that he's trying to do. We're blinded in some areas. But what if God brought some light to those areas today? Like what if you actually got healed in Jesus' name of anxiety or depression, spiritual blindness, pain in your body, addiction? What, what if you were no longer known by your condition but you used your former condition to elevate God's call and his plan in your life? What if what if you're no longer blinded by your opinion? If I'm being honest, that would be the greatest miracle in Action Church. That all of us laid down our opinions and picked up the truth that comes from the Word of God. That would be a church on mission. That'd be a miracle in our country of a few thousand people that said, I don't, I don't want to live on opinion, I want to live in a kingdom. And then what if we surrendered and we allow God to bring light into our traditions and our religion? You know, it's never a fun process. This is not fun. I'm really sweaty. <sighs> not just because I wore a jacket in the summer. I don't know why. Poor decision. I was blinded. <laughs> Come on, that's funny. Let's finish with this thought. Let me bring it to life for you. How many morning people do we have in here? Come on, God's chosen. How many night owls? You sleep in, big nappers. 
Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm married to one of those. Like, it's just, it's like 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, hey, are you alive? Like, you haven't moved 14 hours. We go on vacation. Anybody else? I think it's the same. If you're a morning person, you plan vacation. You know what I mean? Like vacation, you need a vacation from your vacation. Any of those people, it's probably the same. If we did a poll, the morning people plan their vacation. The late night people and the sleep in people are like, it's vacation. I don't want to plan anything. Well, I give Steph, my wife, been married 14 years. I give her till about 8.30 or 9 a.m. a vacation. And then it's time to wake up. Like we did not fly all the way here to sleep away vacation. We have things to do. I have an agenda. We have 17 things to do today so we can feel rested and relaxed. We came here to relax. We are gonna plan relaxation. <laughs> so dumb. I'm blinded. Again, I'm just self-healing happening right here at 1045. There's a point where I've just gotta go in. If you're in a hotel, you know you've got the, the two sets of shades. You've got the see, kind of the see-through shades. Be careful when you're changing. You've got the see-through shades, and then you've got the blackout shades because they don't know where you came from. Maybe you flew international. Maybe you're overnight. And if you need to sleep all day, you got the blackout shades. Well, that room is pitch black dark. You have no idea what you're doing. And too many of us are living in darkness. We're bumping into things. We can't see any things. But once you get used to the darkness, you can see, you got to catch this. You can see just enough to get around. When you wake up in the middle of the night and you've been pitch black, you know you can see just enough to get to the bathroom, just enough to get some water. You can function in darkness, but you can never live fulfilled in darkness. And there's a moment where you have to come in that hotel room and it's about 9 a.m., it's about 9 a.m. for us, where I just have to rip open those shades. Babe, it's time to wake up. The sun is out. The waves are crashing. The golf course is open. It's time to go. And here's the reaction. Here's the reaction, and here could be your reaction today. It's a pillow over the head. It's a, what are you doing? And at first, when you open the shades, you, you, you know the face that you make or you've seen on your spouse or whoever you're in the room with. You open up, and they're like, oh, gosh. Oh, it's painful. Like, turn it off. Quit talking about that. Don't read that verse anymore. And then for a, a second, you, you, you can't see as good as you could the darkness because now your, your eyes are not quite adjusted. And so at first, you don't really know what to do or, or what to say. I've never lived in the light before. I've never allowed the light of the gospel to come into my marriage or come into my addiction or come into my depression. Now, I don't know really what to do, but there's a moment where everything begins to see clearly. And I'm just here to tell you today, that's how you were created to live. Not in the darkness, but in the light of the gospel. And I want to read a couple verses as we close this series. I'm not going to get a chance to read all of them for time's sake, but just a couple of them. Isaiah 9, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of the deep darkness, a light has dawned. I love Genesis 1. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light and that it was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. I'm here to tell you that you cannot live in both worlds. When light comes in, darkness is removed, but the choice is yours. Will you live in darkness or will you live in light? John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Romans 13, here's where I wanna to get to today because this is for dozens if not hundreds of you in our auditoriums are watching today. Romans 13, 12, the night is nearly over. My prayer all week would be this is where the dawn breaks in your life. This is where the shades are pulled back over whatever, whatever area it is and God's word and God's power speaks clearly into your life. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here and I believe it's today. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Ephesians 5, for once you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. I pray today that we surrender our condition, our opinion, and our traditions, and we allow the light of God's word and the light of his Holy Spirit to come into every area, and we begin to walk and live as children of light. Would you bow your heads at all of our locations? Every head bowed, every eye closed. God, we love you. And we thank you for your word in John 9. We thank you that it's changing us today. Shining a spotlight on some areas in our life. Church, every head bowed, every eye closed. Here at Winter Park, South Orlando, Sanford, watching in your home right now, an action pop up, wherever you are. I believe several of you are gonna give your life to Jesus for the very first time today. And that's why we gathered. So we did everything that we're doing across all of our platforms so that you can meet Jesus. But I really feel like today, even more than first time salvations, that this was a message of recommitment. 
Because if you're like me, I, I've lived where some of my life was in the light and some of it was in the dark. Compartmentalization, rooms, closets. Don't let any light in here. I like this condition, it's my identity. I like my opinion, it makes me feel secure, it makes me feel in control. I like my religion and tradition because then I don't have to mess with what God actually wants to do. I just put him when I want him, where I want him. What if you surrender all of those today? And say, Jesus, I, I accept that you lived for me a perfect life so you could die as me in my place and that I receive victory through your resurrection. If that's you today and you say, Pastor Justin, I wanna start a relationship with Jesus or today I wanna recommit my life to him. Would you raise your hand right where you are? Say, I, I need Jesus. I wanna reign in the kingdom of God for eternity by surrendering my life today. Thank you, thank you. Yep, several here at Winter Park, proud of you. Come on, Sanford, South Orlando, anybody watching online? God's moving. If you raise your hand, you can put it down. Pray this in your hearts. I pray it out loud. Say this, say, God, I love you. And God, I thank you for saving me. I acknowledge I'm a sinner and I'm saved only by your grace. And I'm confessing with my mouth and I'm believing in my heart that you are the Lord. And I'm giving you that place today, complete control. God, have your way in my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now, God, I pray for all of us as we close out this series. God, I pray in Jesus' name that that sickness is removed, that you are our priority, and that God, we are gonna allow the light of your word, your gospel, and your power to shine on all of our life. And we're different because of it. We love you, it's your name we pray. Everybody said amen. Church, can we celebrate all the decisions? Come on, really celebrate them.